The topics to cover, we could probably spend seven hours on this easily. Um, what I would like to do is just hear a little bit from all of our panelists uh, so you guys can hear who they are, sort of this space that they're working in. Uh, we've got a couple of smaller, uh, uh, short slide presentations. Open it up for some crosstalk and conversation. Um, what I will say is in the phone conversations and the lunch that we've just had, uh, this is a really exciting space. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a space that has been uh, maybe misrepresented in some ways. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of potential for real good to come from medical marijuana. Uh, I'm from California. We're in a state where we have uh, quasi-legalization and medical marijuana is, is uh, in many ways not, not, uh, not the words that are used to describe it. So um, I am going to uh, open it up to, to you guys, starting with Alice. You guys can introduce yourselves and we'll get into a conversation. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. I know you had a lot of different choices. I appreciate your being here. So I'm Alice Mead. I've been with GW Pharmaceuticals for 17 of its 18 years. Before that, I was an attorney with the California Medical Association, and I analyzed the very first medical marijuana initiative. So I've been sort of kicking around these issues for, I hate to say, 20 years. And I now specialize, really my focus is the Controlled Substances Act, international treaty considerations, and I try to steer GW now that it's come to the US to conduct its research so it's able to do it as smoothly as possible. Oh, I got it. Um, uh, my name's Sue Sisley. I'm a physician based in Scottsdale, Arizona, where I practice internal medicine and psychiatry, and I also my practice is mostly military veterans, tribes. We have 22 federally recognized tribes in Arizona, and uh, police and fire. And so I've developed a specialty in PTSD, and many of you know about our research. We have a randomized controlled trial looking at whole plant cannabis for military veterans with PTSD. That's study was submitted to the FDA back in 2010. We had an IND number and an FDA approval assigned in early 2011, and here we are over five years later still unable to implement this research. So we've become experts on the barriers to doing cannabis research. Uh, I should say botanical, you know, whole plant cannabis research is a very tricky and um, you know, it's a, a process that's, that's systematically impeded by our federal government and our um, experience is a perfect example of that. So I'm excited to tell you more about how this works. Oh, Hi, I'm Rose Habib. I'm a director of processing for the workshop in the state of Oregon currently. Uh, I entered the cannabis industry in uh, probably about 2009 in Montana where I opened an analytical lab uh, for a, a very small medical industry there. Uh, when Washington legalized, I joined the workshop and became the director of processing there. We uh, operate as an extraction, refinement, and post-extraction formulation uh, company service provider. And uh, so we do a lot of uh, development of precisely dosed products for uh, the medical market and also for uh, the recreational market in the future. Hi, my name is Nicholas Vita. Thank you for having us. Um, thank you uh, for listening. Um, I'm the uh, vice chairman and CEO of Columbia Care. Uh, we are one of the nation's largest uh, operators of medical marijuana dispensaries and cultivation centers. We're fully integrated in each of our markets, and those markets include New York, Massachusetts, Arizona, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Illinois, just to name a few. And um, I, I wish we had the expertise of the me other members on this panel, but we are delighted to be here because we think there is an awful lot of potential for this product, uh, for the sector, and, and for these, uh, these concepts to turn into really commercialized and helpful uh, drugs. You can see that the focus of my talk is going to be about um, is, is CBD or cannabidiol, which has garnered a huge amount of interest in patient communities and the public. Policymakers and regulators and researchers seems everyone is interested in CBD these days. You've already heard that I'm affiliated with GW. GW was founded in 1998 in the UK by Drs. Jeffrey Guy and Brian Whittle, hence the GW. Um, they had, in a sort of a perfect storm, in a probably in a good way, of um, experience and expertise that allowed them even to think about embarking on such a crazy, that's what people called it back then, sometimes even now, program, which was to develop a whole range of prescription medications 
that are derived from components of the cannabis plant or combinations of components, but in accordance with modern medical standards. So we've come a long way in those 18 years. We have research collaborations with 36 universities around the world. We're doing research in a wide range of disease areas. We have our first product, Sativex, that I'm not gonna talk about today, that's approved in 28 countries outside the US. And we're completing phase three clinical trials, which is the last stage of clinical research with our purified CBD product, Epidiolex, in children with intractable epilepsy. So how do we do it? So we take chemically defined cannabis strains, we cultivate them under very highly controlled conditions, we extract the active ingredients and every step is quality controlled. Um, we take that, that extract that you can see up there, now in the case of the CBD, we start with a high CBD expressing plant, and we take the extract and we put it through a purification process to remove the THC because we are treating children with very young developing brains and we felt that the risk-benefit profile was such that we should remove the THC. As I said, we're studying a number of disease areas, glioma, schizophrenia, diabetes, uh, cancer pain, spasticity, of course, different kinds of epilepsy, uh, with different cannabinoid formulations and ratios. So what do we do in the US? Well, we bring in standardized, these standardized extracts. We don't bring in the herbal material and then they are distributed to research sites that are licensed by the DEA to conduct research. They can be independent sites that have their own IN investigational new drug exemptions, and then they can import our extracts, or they can be part of our clinical trial program, or as I'll mention later, they can be part of something called expanded access, which is a type of uh, compassionate access that FDA allows. And since 2006, DEA has licensed over 100 research sites to do Schedule One research with our different preparations. Now, why are we looking at CBD? You know, the cannabis plant has been called a treasure trove because it has, the count never ends, over 100, some say 120 cannabinoids. They all have different therapeutic profiles, and so they all could be developed into medications. Now, CBD and THC are really the primary ones, the predominant ones. But really, only THC has any real psychoactive effects which is, most people don't realize. They think cannabis, they think psychoactivity, they think THC, but there are all these other cannabinoids. Now CBD doesn't bind to the body's endogenous cannabinoid receptors, which is probably why it doesn't exhibit that kind of THC-like psychoactivity. And until the last few years, it was essentially bred out of modern cannabis because that was bred up for its THC content. And why are we looking at CBD in children with epilepsy? Well, there are a lot of children who have epilepsy in the US, about a half million. <laughs> and about 30% of them aren't controlled with existing medications. So there's a huge amount of need. And that need is even greater in certain specific types of childhood epilepsy. Many of those have genetic components. And in those types, as many as 90% of the patients can be resistant to what's available now. So again, there's a huge amount of patient need. We are studying what you see in red, Lennox Gasto or LGS, Dravet syndrome, and tuberous sclerosis complex. We have four clinical trials, run two in Dravet and two in LGS, that involve over 500 children. They're the largest clinical trials being conducted in these syndromes. We also, most people don't realize that those are the efficacy trials, but there are many other trials we have to do to satisfy FDA. There are drug-drug interactions and there are pharmacological studies. There are drug-food interactions. There are abuse liability studies. It comes from the cannabis plant, after all, even though it's just CBD. We uh, hope to submit a new drug application by the end of this year, and we have just started our tuberous sclerosis complex clinical study. We were thrilled to announce, not very recently, that one of our, uh, our, one of our two Dravet studies was positive, highly statistically significant, in favor of epidiolex over placebo. We were looking at convulsive seizures over the treatment period compared to the baseline. So this is very hopeful for us. Um, it, the epidiolex was generally pretty well tolerated. There was somnolence, diarrhea, and other uh, side effects, but generally well tolerated. We had orphan drug, drug designation for epidiolex for both Dravet and Lennox Gesto, and fast track designation for uh, Dravet, which should make that development program go more quickly, which is why we hope we can submit by the end of the year. 
Then there are also 22 physician-sponsored expanded access programs. Again, this is under FDA's expanded or compassionate access regulations. FDA has approved, separate from our clinical trials, over 900 children to receive Epidiolex through these programs. These aren't placebo controlled. We can't use them, sadly, for FDA approval because they aren't. But there are many different kinds of epilepsies represented in these programs that really the worst of the worst kids who have failed on many other kinds of therapies uh, are eligible to enroll. And uh, it has generated quite some interesting data. These physicians use pretty much the same protocol. So they've been able to put their data together and present them at scientific conferences. And the most recent one was December of last year at the American Epilepsy Society. And the results we felt were consistent with what we found in our clinical trials. So how would you go about taking a botanical product through the FDA pathway? Is it even possible? FDA is used to approving new synthetic single molecule products. But FDA has created a pathway called uh, Guidance for Industry for Botanical Drug Products. Now it's pretty strict, a little more lenient in the early stages, but pretty strict the farther along you get as far as the, the, the standardization and batch-to-batch -batch consistency, and you still have to do those randomized placebo-controlled trials. The herbal material has to be grown under highly standardized conditions, and the content has to be reproducible, which I think Sue's going to talk about. That creates a problem in the US. You may have to extract the, the active ingredients so they can be administered in an appropriate delivery system, but I mean, I would, that's what I always said five years ago, but now there's an inhaler being developed in Israel that uses granules of cannabis. <clears throat> there are other new formulation technologies that may make it possible to mill or somehow microencapsulate a highly standardized cannabis material. I think we'll, time will tell whether that can get through the FDA pathway. Cannabinoids are hard to work with. Right? They, they are unstable in air and light and time. Uh, they don't dissolve in water. They have to be decarboxylated. Uh, it's tricky to come up with a dosage form that's stable. We believe in the FDA process. We think it provides benefits to patients. It, it ensures standardized products. You know what the dose is. They're administered appropriately. Uh, physicians get all the data that they need to make prescribing decisions. Patients may be able to get health insurance coverage. Uh, they go through monitored channels, uh, and ma manufacturers like us, we're accountable for the quality, and we can't make unsupported promotional claims, and, these, and physicians are monitoring their patients. So we believe in the process, but the process <laughs> takes a long time. Most products fail. It costs a lot of money, and at the end, if you are successful, you get one formulation for one medical condition, right? So it's a challenging way to proceed. Thank you very much for your attention. That was terrific, Alice. Thank you so much for that. Um, I that's not true. Wonderful. Um, and I, I want to agree um, on many things that Alice said, but one thing especially is the FDA is not the enemy in this process. A lot of people heard a lot of folks say that they thought they were the problem, but it's actually, um, they, they're physician investigators at the FDA, they're not law enforcement. So they've been really wonderful to work with compared to these other agencies. Um, they actually have worked collaboratively with us for several months and, and expedited our approval process fairly quickly. So I have no um, problem with them. Um, here is, I want to just give you guys just a few um, examples of how the U.S. government has systematically impeded cannabis efficacy research in this country. Um, so I'm going to use our study as an example because it's a perfect way of, of d illustrating this. Um, why is it that if cannabis, which is the least toxic of all the drugs in Schedule 1, why does it have the most barriers to research? Um, and so we're going to show you. My argument is that this is kind of classic federal government overreach. Here they are, you know, micromanaging every aspect of efficacy research. So if you want to study any controlled substance in the U.S., these are the three agencies you have to go through. We're not objecting to that. That's totally reasonable. Um, but what we are objecting to is that if you look at these two uh, examples side by side, take heroin and other Schedule One drug versus cannabis, and what we had to deal with, we had to go through two additional layers 
of federal government red tape that only marijuana is subject to. No other um, controlled substances have to, have to deal with a public health service review and the NIDA monopoly. You don't go through a monopoly. If you want to buy heroin for a study, you can buy research grade heroin from any lab in the country. So this is a very bizarre situation that cannabis is the least toxic yet has the most barriers. The Public Health Service review was an absurd experience. It was a redundant review that happens after we've already obtained FDA approval. We have to go through this other process that took us three years to get through to, to address all the mountains of criticism they had about our protocol, unfounded criticism, I would, I would submit. And uh, during that time, 24,000 veterans killed themselves in this country. Um, but it ultimately, they approved the study a few days after Sanjay Gupta came out with his Weeds documentary where he interviewed Nora Volkow at NIDA and asked her why she was blocking these studies and suddenly we had our approval letter. So it was pretty impressive. And I would say, you know, the good news is from last year, many of you heard that we managed to end the Public Health Service review. So because after we finally did get our um, our approval from PHS, we you know, went through and had conducted a very vigorous lobbying effort showing them how ridiculous this added um, government red tape was and Obama administration last year announced the end of this PHS review, fortunately. But sadly, this doesn't end the barriers to research, right? The biggest, um, so even though our study is fully funded, we have, we've hurdled almost all the federal government obstacles um, yet yeah, why can't we get underway? It's because of this, the DE, we call it now the DEA mandated NIDA monopoly because NIDA claims they don't want this monopoly, that they never asked for it. Um, so NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, has a government enforced monopoly on the only federally legal supply of whole plant marijuana for any of these federally regulated trials. So if you want to do a clinical trial, any experimental design around whole plant marijuana, you have to buy your cannabis from the University of Mississippi. That's the facility. U University of Mississippi was licensed by NIDA through the DEA process. They were, they were given the only license in the country back in 1968. And uh, the challenge is, here's Dr. El Soli. He's the head of that facility in Mississippi. He's got his hand in a barrel of ground up cannabis. That's basically what they do through the whole plant into the grinder from root to tip. And they roll it up in these cigarettes, which are sent out to investigators all over the country. So I want to impress upon you, there is the, there, it's not that there's no research happening. There are tons of investigators studying cannabis, whole plant cannabis from this stock right here. Um, but, but these are primarily safety studies, right? The, looking at harmful side effects of marijuana and addiction potential of marijuana. Very few efficacy studies looking at you know, how effective is marijuana at treating a certain illness. Very few efficacy studies ever get to slip through the system and that's why you see there's such a paucity of, of really rigorous research in this country. But when you dump out the contents of those cigarettes, Dr. Rousseau was kind enough to take some pictures for us and show basically, you know, this is what we're getting. This is the study drug that we're required to work with, right? Um, a lot of extraneous <laughs> plant material. Um, so this is a, a, a big cause of concern for a lot of us in the medical community who feel that this study drug potentially sabotages an efficacy study from the beginning, right? Because if we're, what we'd really like to work with is the flowering plant material where we believe the maximum therapeutic benefit is, but we're unfortunately instead trying to use that. Um, and so they claim that they have a separator now that takes out some of that stuff that you saw, the stems and the sticks and all that. But bottom line is, why do other countries have multiple growers for research? And why is the U.S. on one of the few that enforces this single government monopoly? Um, the other countries realize that if you're going to have an adequate and uninterrupted supply, that you have to a license multiple growers, and that's what so many other countries have done. Um, if you go to Canada, there's a, you know over 10 different growers all able to grow cannabis for research. In Israel, there's eight different manufacturers licensed by the Minister of Health to do research. Um, so the problem we have, I, I'll give you some examples of why NIDA marijuana is inadequate, right? 
the, if you go on the NIDA website, you'll see that the, oh, the, if you want a high THC cannabis, that's defined as 12% THC. So any of you who know about what's happening in the real world um, know that, you know, especially I'm doing a study on military veterans. I can tell you most of our vets, whether they're buying marijuana from the black market or from a dispensary, they're getting cannabis that's 19 to 25% THC. So we're trying to conduct a real world study and look at what veterans do from day to day, but we're forced to use cannabis that's not more than 12% THC. That's a problem. And um, so and, and so they're required by the control, oh, that's the other thing I wanna tell you. And so when we ask them to produce a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD to THC, um, we said, you know, can you get us a 12%, 12%. Um, uh, after 20 months of waiting, they finally said, um, we can get you about 7%, 7%. So the Controlled Substances Act says that they're required to produce a continuous and uninterrupted adequate supply. And I would argue that that's not adequate. Um, the other problem that we have with NIDA is that they don't turn over their drug master file. So that would be an expectation, right, that there would be transparency about how the study drug is grown. Was it grown with pesticide? Are there any other cannabinoids in it besides CBD and THC? That's the only information I get about the study drug. What They give you the ratio of CBD to THC. You don't know what terpenes are in it, what flavonoids, nothing. So this is frustrating that they are taking re relentless amounts of taxpayer dollars, but not um, sharing details about how the study drug is, uh, you know, what's in it. And then, of course, this is why um, the the, tr the um, uh, monopoly continues is because DEA claims that they have a right to the monopoly because of this treaty. International treaty says that there's only one grower, but that wasn't meant to be um, a, intended toward research. And so um, even we, I'll tell you about this, but there was basically a lawsuit that, that highlighted this further and a judge um, said that that was a bogus argument from the DEA. So, um, you know, there, obviously the treaty is aware that there are other countries that license multiple growers. The treaty hasn't come in and sanctioned these other countries. So HHS, you know, they've already acknowledged that they don't want the, the, the uh, monopoly. This is a great thing. We're seeing all these very unlikely allies come forward now, like Nora Volkow and Kevin Sabet, who's here at this conference somewhere from Project Sam, has stepped forward and said, we believe that the NIDA monopoly should end, the DEA monopoly, and that we should license other growers. And this was a, a big help to us. Um, I'll say, it, so what happened was she testified, Nora testified at a US Senate hearing last year. It was a big bombshell and she said, that she was interviewed by them and said, do you believe it would be beneficial to allow um, NIDA to grant more, you know, or the DEA to grant other um, licenses, and she said yes, I think it would be beneficial. She went on to say, you know, are, are you concerned the monopoly is a barrier to retelling you earlier? An adequate and uninterrupted supply of cannabis. So we would argue that this monopoly has been in violation of the Controlled Substances Act for decades now. They've never been able to provide an adequate supply, meaning they haven't been able to provide the strains that scientists are requesting. And so it's not an adequate supply. It's not uninterrupted because waiting 20 months for marijuana, any expert grower at this conference could have had cannabis grown to spec for us within three months. Um, in any you know, regulated um, industrial agriculture setting, they should be able to do that. So to wait 20 months and still not be able to get the strength requested is, is unacceptable. So, um, yeah, so let me just jump to the end here and then we'll, um, I'll let everybody else um, jump in here. Um, let me just say that the reason that this is such an imperative is because marijuana from NIDA is not authorized to be sold as a prescription medicine. So our goal in trying to do this study is we're trying to put whole plant cannabis through the entire FDA drug development process. We're starting with phase two then we go to phase three. After phase three, it's possible that the FDA could authorize whole plant to be on the market with an FDA indication if the data is compelling enough. But the problem is that we can't use NIDA marijuana for phase three, right? NIDA marijuana is only allowed to be used 
for research purposes, and that means only through phase two. Once you get to phase three, you're actually actively in the drug development process, and you're, you end up, you know, producing whatever product you use during phase three is the product. We finish our study, hopefully, if, the, if we get our Schedule One license in the next couple months, we should be done with the study in two years, and we need to have a source that would allow us, and, and so basically this is what I wanted to impress upon you is that right now this is the way that, that you know, we are being hampered from putting cannabis, whole plant cannabis through the entire drug development process. As long as the monopoly exists, we're not going to be able to do this. And I just want to point out my sponsor, MAPS, many of you know MAPS is a nonprofit based out of Santa Cruz. They've done an incredible job for the last two decades of, of fighting this um, war on research here. They've been, they managed to sue the DEA. They, they won. If you've ever heard of anybody beating the DEA, it's the first time I've heard in 2001. They actually, on behalf of Professor Craker, who's a world-class plant biologist out of UMass, um, they, he put petition the DEA to license him to grow cannabis for research. Um, the judge actually, back in 2007 then, the administrative law judge um, recommended that the DEA end their monopoly and license other growers, but sadly, um, the judge two years later, I'm sorry, the, the DEA two years later rejected their own judge's opinion and decided to keep their monopoly, which they continue to enjoy now. We tried to take them to Court of Appeals and we failed. So the bottom line is here's the, the end is the Attorney General, the DEA really isn't accountable to anybody, clearly. They're, they don't seem to be accountable to the public. Um, theoretically, they're accountable to the Attorney General who could step in and urge them to fix this. Drug czar, um, the President could do an executive order in the same way he did with the Public Health Service Review and he could end this. Um, but we have other unlikely allies besides Nora Volkow and Kevin Sabet, we also have Grover Norquist, one of the big conservatives, has also said that he believes that the NIDA monopoly is unfair, unjust. He talked about how you know any agricultural product should be fair game for, for research. So this is great to have all that, and we're hoping that you'll help us in this. That's why we wanted to share this kind of detail with you so you knew what the problems are. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really good information. And I guess just to continue to drill down on, on, on this point, uh, if the goal is to provide uh, dependable, predictable, effective treatments uh, for patients who need it, um, I want to go over to Nicholas because uh, on the conversation we had about a week ago, uh, he's really talking about this concept of validation. And I was wondering if you just talk a little bit about how we can get to where we're at right now utilizing some of the tools that, that these two identified to, to get to that place of validation. Absolutely, and I, I would echo many, many of the sentiments and, and, and the viewpoints that were shared um, by both of you. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to say a few things to be intentionally provocative, and the reason for that is to is primarily because we're looking at a, a brand new industry. We're looking at a new opportunity that can literally impact the lives of millions of people. And so, um, Please take what I say with a grain of salt. But I, I actually would make the argument that the biggest impediment to real research is the inability to properly differentiate between the medical initiatives and the recreational initiatives. And because that has not been made, institutions are unwilling to take risk. And you have institutions that have risk all over the country. We are partnered with several academic medical centers, uh, even in New York State, we're partnered with agricultural land-grant universities that rely on federal subsidies that want to participate in this. But what they encounter is not a federal obstacle, not to say that they don't exist, but what they encounter are internal opposition from compliance groups because of the downside risk. And I think that the most unfortunate thing that we've seen is no one ever stands up and says, we don't think this has medical medical." benefit. They stand up in, the, in, in, in crowds and in communities and they say, we don't want this to turn into something that has a number of unintended consequences. And so the way we have approached it, and we fundamentally believe that this plant has medical value. Um, we also believe that the FDA process, the type of process that the FDA enforces and provides and structure is very important for the medical community to really understand how to use a product like this in a medical setting. 
But where, where we run into the, the obstacle and where we have the freedom because we're not going through an FDA process is we also believe in the entourage effect. And I know you had mentioned this as well, but it's so hard to create a product and an environment where you need to manufacture the flexibility to utilize all of the different components of the plant properly to really understand how they impact patients in different patient categories because there's so much subjectivity to each qualifying condition that we're familiar with. And when I think about, you know, the, 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 the way people try to actually mimic the entourage effect, it's really by falling back onto the argument that leaf is the only solution. The problem with leaf in our experience is that you can only get a 75% level range of consistency batch over batch, no matter how strict your environmental controls are. So what we have turned to is a much more pharmaceutical type of manufacturing process where we fractionate, we formulate, we process, we do all these things with the natural extract, um, but then we, we bear down into individual CBD categories because who knows how each type of CBD impacts intractable epilepsy. We, we just, we don't, uh, and we, we should, but we don't. We wish we did. But if you're talking to a member of the medical community, having that level of sophistication is invaluable. And having, being able to describe something simple like you know, a stability test or you know, f the pharmacokinetic impact of different methods of delivery for different types of illnesses. These are things that GW is dealing with all the time. Um, some of the industry players, ourselves included, are trying to mimic that sophistication and that process where, they, where we believe that they have uh, shown to use best practices, uh, where we differ is, is only based on the fact that we can because it is a schedule and substance. So the FDA doesn't have overview. And the second thing I would say is, just out of curiosity, how many people in this room think that this should be rescheduled from a schedule one to a schedule two product? Just raise your hands. That's, that's amazing. Okay, so, in, or, so what it means is it, would, it basically, it means that you're taking the product from a very uh, limited access where it has quote unquote no medical value in the eyes of the uh, of, of the DEA, uh, and you would basically be putting into a category where the FDA would have oversight. Um, we are not, even though it would probably be in our best interest, we are not advocates at this point for a rescheduling of cannabis, and it's not because we don't believe it has medical value. It's because the only way we think that we can actually get long term sustainable. Uh, support from all the stakeholders that are still questioning how these products are manufactured is if we let the process take its time. Um, and I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. And I, I frankly, you know, we've tried, we've gone through several IRB processes and failed. It's just, we're trying to think about this. If, if it's taken 40 years for the industry to get to this point and people to realize that this really does have medical value, how do we take the next 10 years or the next five years? It may take that long. And I know people are working on it, but that's, that's that's one of the things that we're, we're, we're trying to wrestle with and we wrestle with every day because we need all of the stakeholders, especially the ones that don't agree with what we're doing, to support what we're doing and how we're doing it. And so it's, it's a complicated issue, but ultimately product development is at the core of what everybody should be focused on in the, in the industry. And unless we can, back to my initial point, unless we can separate the difference and really make that distinction between medical and recreational, it's going to be hard for anyone to get across that finish line. That's great. We'd really, really love to, to jump in and spend some time on that. I did want to go to Rose, though, because um, Rose has been really involved in uh, creating a lot of the products that are being used in, in the medical marijuana space. And I think what one of your goals is, and what everyone's talking about, is getting better performance uh, out of these drugs and getting fewer of the, of the negative side effects like uh, that you get from pesticides or metals or other things that, that you've been working on. Can you talk a little bit about the products that you've been making? Absolutely. What what uh, where I come from in the industry is is the, the supply side of what you know you guys are trying to do, or that you know in in an herbal therapy more arena. Um, I, I guess uh, when you were talking about rescheduling to schedule two, I would you know I think a lot of us would say we would rather deschedule. I'd rather look at cannabis as an herbal therapy than as a, a pharmaceutical agent, and I think that the regulations that uh, apply to those two completely separate industries um, are are very different, and um, I, I think the the low toxicity of cannabis would lend itself more as an herbal therapy, and the regulations, FDA regulations that um, support that industry more than it does. I mean, it also has pharmaceutical, obviously, 
um, impact. But um, as is coming from a supply side, and having worked in the nutraceutical industry briefly also, there is a, a lack of institutional support for the cannabis industry that other like nutraceutical industries have. And when they're trying to meet FDA regulations for heavy metals testing or pesticide residue or solvent residue um, or micro uh, contamination or stability studies in their products, they don't have outside laboratories that they can contract with to do that. In the nutraceutical industry, if you want to test your, your herbal extract, you send it to Eurofins or uh, an inst another lab that just does metals testing. And they do millions and millions of metals tests for all kinds of industries across the country all day long. But they're not going to touch a cannabis product because they have a whole other business that's perfectly supported and they don't need to jeopardize their entire their entire company to do that sort of safety testing for your industry. And also with pesticide residue testing or, um, or solvent residue testing or stability studies, which are all services that the nutraceutical industry or the pharmaceutical industry actually uh, routinely outsource to other companies that specialize in those, industry, in those tests. Um, so we in the cannabis industry don't have a validated, promulgated method that everyone uses to analyze for cannabinoid content. We don't have a, a promulgated method that's used to test for uh, pesticides. And some of the uh, chemical companies are starting, like ResTech, uh, are doing research and, and providing some background information to help um, the cannabis analytical labs do that sort of testing properly but it's, it's just up and coming. And the, in order to produce these uh, regular, precisely dosed, safe um, products for, you know, for medical testing, for, for uh, observational studies, uh, we need to have that, that institutional support to produce that level of product. We're capable of producing that level of product, but we don't have, it, it's much more expensive and much more, complicated for us because we don't have any institutional support. Additionally, we're regulated by a state. So we have to do all of our services within the state lines of a single state in order to, we have to find our patients inside that state. We have to grow the cannabis inside that state. We have to test it inside that state. And we have to create products inside that state with no outside because that's, interna that's interstate drug trafficking. Once you, once you cross over into that, which is not something that somebody's making guarana pills has to really worry about. So um, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to jump into what you're talking about, and then I'd I love us to get into a little bit of crosstalk. But um, there's, I think one of the challenges is standardizing what is called medicine. And, um, you know, the, the charge has been thrown out that advocates for legalization have used medical marijuana as a beachhead in states, soften up the voter population, uh, get them to get okay with the idea, in, with, with the goal of moving towards full recreational marijuana. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's, you, you guys are all working in, in very legitimate spaces, but yet a lot of the language is advocacy because you're fighting for your space. And uh, I, I would just like to get your thoughts on, on what that allegation, uh, the use of medical marijuana in states is, and how, how can you guys and, and your, your inner circles better define what is medicine so that, uh, so, so we can move towards, towards a, a more, a, more uh, a, a space of validation. One, I th in our experience, uh, being operating, operating in so many different markets, uh, and I'll just pick on New York for a second, I think New York has done an extraordinary job of developing the framework. Um, we have independent validation that we have to go through before we ever send it to the Wadsworth Laboratory, which is the state-run laboratory where they test every, you know, every controlled substance. And we test for, you know, we test the chemistry, we test for heavy metals, we test for impurities, we test stability. Every single thing that would be required for a pharmaceutical-grade product is done independently in New York State. Uh, and every operator in New York State has to abide by those things. And I think that the, it, it does take an enormous amount of investment. Um, and frankly, it's made us better at what we do because we've been forced to make that investment and think about it in those terms. But I would say that the, the industry itself, and I'm going to, again, this is, this is meant to be provocative. 
there is so much low-hanging fruit depending upon how the economic pie can be divvied up based on the format of the regulations. So if you have a very highly regulated medical framework, you must produce products of a certain caliber. If you don't, then you're left in a situation where it's effectively a self-regulated body. And some, many of the participants we're familiar with have an enormous amount of compassion and care and, and commitment to that level of professionalism, but there are always a few folks that are looking to make a quick buck, and that's where you run into troubles. So I would say that ultimately it has to fall back to the way the states want and the communities that the states effectively represent want these programs to be delivered and provided for. Um, I would say that there definitely are at least two, but very, you know, multiple number of approaches that different states have taken. And uh, a number of states have, have passed or have, have approached the regulatory structure as, as hands off as they possibly can. Uh, this is, this is a, a, something stinky that they don't want to touch or have their names associated with. And so they're just as happy to let a citizen's initiative for medical cannabis pass and provide as little support and regulation, uh, regulatory structure as possible because they don't want to deal with it. Um, on the East Coast, we've definitely seen the opposite, where it's been a much more of a pharmaceutical approach to, to regulation, where they've definitely very much limited the number of people that can be involved in production and processing and distribution. Um, it costs much more money, and it's definitely a much more of a pharma gold model um, than it has been in, on the West side. For sure, and I and I can't say which one is better or worse. I think that it's definitely on the East Coast. There's been a definitely a restriction in access. Um, perhaps the quality of the products is better, and that that may be true. But I think that that the in the end access has been severely restricted. Whereas on the West side of the country, it has been mostly the opposite, where it's been very accessible, but the quality has been quite variable in what's what's possible. Um, I'll say, um, I made a couple notes here. I was going to say, my concern, I, I support um, these state efforts to create a regulated market for medical cannabis, but um, my disappointment is that very few of these states are actually allocating any of the revenue toward clinical research. And I would say I think it's negligent to legalize medical cannabis without actively conducting clinical trials on how patients are responding to this plant, what, what adverse events are occurring. All of that data needs to be captured. It's not, I'll give you an example, in Arizona, my home state, we've developed, you know, we've accumulated a $9 million surplus in our state just from the medical program, from selling cards to patients, collecting licensing fees from license holders, and um, it, it's a voter-protected surplus fund. It just sits there stagnating because the law says we're not allowed to use any of that surplus money for research. So the only state I've seen that's done a good job of this is in Colorado. They recently allocated $10 million of their surplus money toward cannabis efficacy research. So that was some of the only money available in the U.S. Um, to look at efficacy of cannabis. It's already been fully allocated a year ago. Still, none of the studies have really been able to get started because of, again, all of the barriers to research. You know, all these nine projects that Colorado has um, backed, has sponsored, have not been able to really get underway yet. So it's a big frustration. But it's the point is that you you can't do clinical research without funding and and that's the very core of this um of the the blockades not just the biggest blockade besides the DEA monopoly is the lack of funding and we we do have to fix that and states could fix this every time we add another medical cannabis state that that should be included in the language of the law whether it's a ballot initiative or a legislative bill we need to start thinking about that otherwise industry's never going to be able to move forward and all these states the first question these patients have i'm a 
medical director now in nine different medical cannabis states. So I'm, I've got a pretty broad um, insight into this problem. And I can tell you, every patient, first thing they want to know is what strains are best for my illness. Those are all questions that we can't answer. What strain, what, what variety, what phenotype of cannabis is should I choose for my um, certain medical condition? All of that research has been impeded by the government. Our study, for example, would be able to start answering questions like that. We're doing a randomized controlled trial looking at four different varieties of whole plant cannabis. So we'll be able to look at a high THC strain, a high CBD strain, a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD to THC. Those are the studies that need to start getting underway. And I would agree with Sue that the huge gap is data. You know, there are certainly efforts to improve quality around the country, but as far as, you know, I'm from California, so 20 years hence now, we still don't know who, who in the sense of what medical conditions benefit, which medical conditions don't, to what extent, what are the side effects, what are the drug-drug interactions. And without those kinds of data, uh, physicians in large numbers are not going to come on board. Uh, especially specialists, you know, they're very demanding in the kind of data that they want to see. And, you know, as far as validation, we will sort of look at what we hear from the state programs, and some of those might throw up some interesting signals that we would then pursue through clinical trials. But Sue is right, that clinical trials, even if one can get the materials as we do, uh, they're expensive, and even if one is not going to go down the drug development pathway and do all those other studies I talked about, uh, even if one is going to do an investigator-led trial, it's still expensive. And so, you know, and you're still really just studying one or two ratios for one medical condition. So I'm not quite sure how to, you know, fix that problem, but, but the parallel system we have going right now is not generating any data. Just to piggyback on those comments, um, the data, candidly, uh, so one of the things we tried to do when we started Columbia Care is uh, collect some of this data. It was observational. Uh, it was done a very in a very, very rudimentary way because you know we weren't scientists. We just were curious to see how people were using the products, you know what what they were using it for, and some of the things we've been able to observationally conclude. Is, so, for example, in Washington D.C., 68 percent of our patients with neuropathy, uh, HIV-related neuropath neuropathic pain, used to use benzos or opioids. They no longer do. They now use our products as the primary means to control their neuropathy. Um, st statistics like that that were very encouraging to understand uh, are not scientific, but I think the uh, going back to my earlier point about the regulations and how why they're so important in again New York um, and other states do this as well. But I'm picking on New York just because we're in New York today. Um, because the recommendation requires a physician to actually comment on the specific types of ratios and the dosing and the ty and, and because a pharmacist is involved and there's a conversation that relates to titration, um, that data for the first time is really now now available and it's now it's being collected um, on a grander scale. Now, I'm not sure if, our, if everyone in New York is doing that, but I know that we are because those are very basic questions that everyone should understand and, and really try to try to know because it really does inform the discussion on which tracks of research you want to pursue and commit resources to just as a, as a, as a starting point. Um, in the best case scenario, it can actually help you understand efficacy, it can, ha it can help you understand toxicity, all the other sort of adverse events that are critical to really developing a, a commercially viable product. But uh, ultimately, I think what's happened is that the new regulatory regimes are smartening up and they're actually forcing the participants of and our stakeholders from all sides to really provide and gather that, uh, give them the opportunity to, to actually gather that type of information, which is pretty exciting. I would say to um, Nick, mention that he's, um, you know, his uh, group has done a good job of collecting data, but the issue is if it's not published, um, it doesn't exist. In the physician world, we don't care about anything that isn't in a peer-reviewed medical journal. So the problem we have is we have a ton of wonderful, you know, dispensaries that are doing a wonderful job of collecting data into these softwares, these seed-to-sale tracking software documenting clinical responses to certain varieties of cannabis, but 
you have to have IRB approval before you collect that data in order for it to be publishable. So if there's one thing I want to impress upon you guys before you leave is that any of you who are working with agencies that are collecting this data, you have to know there is a international law under you know Declaration of Helsinki says that you're not allowed to let, to collect data on human subjects without first obtaining IRB approval. So it, IRB is the institutional review boards. They're available in, in a university, in a hospital, and also privately. So for instance, my study, we have private IRB approval. So I don't want you to be daunted if you're a dispensary, a license holder in any state that's not, um, that, that's not working with the university or hospital. That doesn't preclude you from getting IRB approval. It's very inexpensive and quick to go through a private IRB, and we can help you with that. If you want to talk to me after, I'd be happy to guide you on that process. But then finally, then suddenly your data becomes publishable later, and that's extremely valuable for us. And then I just also wanted to encourage you finally when it comes to what Alice was talking about, the desperate need we have for legit data. Um, we need everybody, I know all of you who work in the industry um, have probably heard miraculous stories from patients. and, and back Bad stories too, but you know a lot of people. I'm hearing you know them having transformative, you know, cures to long chronic illnesses. All of those things need to be documented. And case reports, even though the medical community demands randomized controlled trials, the fact is that even simple case reports, a single patient having a tremendous response to a, a cannabis oil for her squamous cell cancer, whatever it is, um, if you can document a, a pre-treatment biopsy and a post-treatment biopsy, you suddenly have the makings of a case report that could be published in a peer-reviewed medical journal. So I would just urge you, this is the only way we're going to really be able to create a body of science is by having a, you know these individual cases create um, the momentum for other further clinical trials.